Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hope everyone can hear me all right. I'm a little sick, but not contagious. Um, I'm going to power through it. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Um, uh, been praying about this for the past uh, two, weeks, two weeks or so because Brother Keith asked if I could preach. And, um, of course, we were out of town last weekend. Been doing a lot of traveling and seeing so much. So many thoughts running through my head. And uh, some stuff came up. Um, the devil just really trying to get after me. And uh, had a whole bunch of verses come, come to mind. Started working on a sermon. And it was very similar um, to a sermon I preached before. And I got to thinking about it and I thought, um, well, this reminds me, why do we come to church? Um, what's, the, what's the purpose of me bringing this message? And I got to thinking about it. And I wasn't questioning uh, preaching or going to church. But I was thinking, like, what does it really mean for us as believers to come and to gather together? And um, just put together some verses, and I'll try not to make it too long. But um, it really came down to three points that, that I felt. And the first one being fellowship and rest. So if you'll turn to uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I know that, uh, I believe that everybody here understands why it's important for us to gather as believers. I believe that we all understand the importance of taking this time to to fellowship with one another, but most importantly, to praise and worship God. Um, but I think sometimes it's good to have a reminder, because sometimes when we do something every day or every week, it feels like a routine. And that's not to say that we're not, uh, we're not maximizing it or we're taking it for granted, but sometimes we don't get the most out of it, or it's not the most intentional thing. So sometimes it's a good reminder. And it's also important for us as a church to establish to the world this is what church is for. This is why we come to church, so that they can see our example, what we believe, and why it's important to us. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Um, so this is talking about very early church, just after Jesus had ascended. And the people gathered together, and I believe this is right after Peter gave the first, uh, the first sermon after the dissension of the Holy Spirit. And it said that the disciples, they gathered together, they, um, they had fellowship, they had a meal, they prayed together, they probably sang together. Just coming together, they, they felt that power of the Holy Spirit washing over them. And that's how it is for us. When we come here, we become rejuvenated by the Holy Spirit. And when we're with one another, I feel like there's a sense of peace that we don't get when we're by ourselves. Sometimes there's a lot of things I want to do, but by myself, I'm afraid, and I want to work on that. I want to improve that, and I'll get to the improvement later. But when I'm with fellow believers, it gives me that confidence to do what's right. And I found a group um, on campus called the Navigators, and I attend uh, a lot of their events, a lot of their Bible studies, and they do a lot of cool things besides just Bible study. And it's so encouraging to go out and do things with fellow believers um, just knowing we're all gathered together in God's name and we're going to go out and preach the gospel and do things the right way. Just being with our fellow believers, so many more blessings. I, I, could, I could talk about it all day. Um, it's also important, I mentioned fellowship and rest. So we talked about the fellowship part, getting together with our fellow believers. But it's also important to rest. In Genesis 2, it tells us after, after God created everything on the seventh day, that God rested. And I believe... God didn't need that rest. I mean, he's God. I don't think he needed to rest. I don't think he had anything to recover for. But it was more of an example for us that we can't go day in and day out and fight the good fight to the best of our abilities and not take a rest. And I think of, of sports, and, and I really like to watch sports, and there's a lot of strategy of how much do you play your best players because they get really tired. You have to have backups. You have to have times for them to rest. You have to have substitutions or shifts or line changes or whatnot, but at the end of the day, nobody can play the full 60 minutes or whatever it is. We get tired. We're human. We fail. But we need that seventh day. We need, or for us, uh, Sunday is the first day of our week. We need that Sunday to rest and recover because the, the spiritual warfare out there, it's, it's something 
way beyond our control. And God's going to be with us, but he said, specifically said that we need to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That Sunday is for us to rest and to be ready for what's next ahead. That time just to become grounded again, to remember what we're fighting for. And I know a lot of people, when they go out, a lot of missionaries, they, they're they ready for it, they're excited, they're prepared, and then they go out in the field somewhere, maybe um, it's a place where they don't have a lot of money, a lot of food, maybe it's a place where there's rampant persecution, what have it, and there are times when they get shaken, they get tired, they get exhausted, maybe they start to doubt, maybe they question, am I the right person for this job, God? And um, sometimes that rest is so important for them. They can't, they can't continue on forever and ever and ever. Sometimes they have to come back. I know some missionaries, they go out for several years somewhere, and they have to come back home for a little while before they go back because they need that rest. And church is like that for us. That rest that sets us on the right path to make the best of our week, to start the week off on the right note. Um, first, uh, first John chapter 1, if you'll turn with me there for just a moment. First John chapter 1, just a few verses starting in verse 3. First John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. What if we walk in the light as he is in the light? We have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanseth us from all sin. So church, going, going to church is not going to save you. Going to church is not enough. But when we come to church, when we truly surrender to Christ, church is a great way to remember who we have fellowship with, and that is Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, our fellowship with our, with our fellow believers is amazing, but it's indescribably better, our fellowship with Christ. And it also says it's important to remember that there's no darkness in God. And sometimes we have to, we have to remember, we go out in the world, we get tempted, and we have all these struggles and these trials, and it's important to remember um, what we should be doing. And church is that place where we are grounded, and that fellowship reminds us of, of who we are, that we're not of the world anymore, but we are called by God. The second, second point I thought of, um, the Lord showed me when I was working on this, was praise and worship. Praise and worship are, are part of the importance of church. And I was so reminded this morning, um, after, after being out of town last week, coming back, and we might be a small church, but I could hear everybody singing, I could feel the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't loud like rock concert loud and I can't you know my eardrums are about to burst but it was loud in, in the power and you could just feel the, the belief and the joy um, and, and uh, about, about to uh, cover a few verses in Psalm 100 if you'd like to go there uh, something my mom always says she, she always says make a joyful noise and this is where it comes from Psalm chapter 100 Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2, says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. We are to come forth and we are to praise God. We are to use this time to worship him and thank him. And I thought of David, and uh, David wrote so many of the psalms, and he was a talented uh, musician. He could write the music. He could sing the music, I'm sure. Uh, he played the, the harp for King Saul. And I thought of all the things that he sang about. And he sang so many, he wrote so many psalms, and some of them are, are very sad, and some of them are very happy. But some of the things he talks about, uh, or sings about, or plays music about in these psalms are just about anything. They're about nature, they're about uh, the kingdom, they're about heaven, they're about uh, family and friends. We can sing and praise God about anything because he is great in all things. Amen. We shouldn't miss out on that opportunity to praise and to worship him. 
And in Luke chapter 19, um, I believe this is during the triumphal, uh, triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, the people start to worship God. And the Pharisees say, uh, tell, tell them to be quiet. Rebuke your disciples. They shouldn't be doing this. This is blasphemy. And he says, if they don't praise and worship God, then the stones will cry out. Why should we pass up on this great opportunity and let the stones or something else, because if the stones don't cry out, something else will. Something will proclaim the name of God, and why should we miss out on that blessing to be part of that? Amen. Um, also, in, in Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Through our singing... We're not just praising and worshiping God. We're also connecting with him on an emotional level. We're connecting with each other. And that unifies the church. When we're all connected in a one mind and one accord, all singing together, praising him together, nothing can stop us. And nothing can stop God. But when we're divided, we're not representing him the right way. We're not preaching the gospel. And we're not uh, pushing forward the kingdom of God. But when we come together united all singing and praising and worshiping him, nothing this world can throw at us is going to stop us or slow us down. Mm -hmm. And another thing I, I get a lot, it says here, uh, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns. Sometimes when we sing, I start to see things in a different way. I learn just like I'm reading the Bible itself from some of these songs. And it's just a great reminder of what Christ did for me. And, and some of the songs go into such elegant detail about uh, the life of Christ and the suffering of Christ or just how a relationship with Christ makes you feel. And it touches me in a way that sometimes I might not get from reading the Bible on a, on a particular day, um, but I get it from the music. So it's important we come together and we praise and we worship him. Um, the last point is sancti sanctification and growth. When we're in the presence of God here in, in the sanctuary, in the church, um, I feel like that's a great time to, to be grounded and to really work on ourselves and to grow. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I, I feel like sometimes when we get home or when we get into the world, wherever it may be, sometimes uh, what we should be doing isn't our first priority. And we don't stop to think. Um, or evaluate ourselves. What, what could I be doing better? What should I work on? What are some things, uh, some, some temptations I've had that I should be praying about? Um, but when we're in the church together, as I said, when we're with our fellow believers and we're in the presence of God, sometimes it's so much easier to stop and evaluate ourselves. In Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart, Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way ever everlasting. When we come to God, we come here in the church and we say, lead me, God, lead me. And we mean it. He will lead us. And as I, as I have said, it's hard. I'm not saying don't do these things at home. That's not at all what I'm saying. But when we come here, it's so much easier in the presence of God and with our fellow believers to truly mean this. And then take it, take that home, take that into the world. And we can start it anywhere, but the church is a great place to be every Sunday for this reminder and, and just the power of the Holy Spirit, the conviction that we get here. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. Just a few verses here. First Thessalonians 4, starting in the first verse. Furthermore, then, we beseech ye, brethren... And exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more, if ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. When we come here, it's a great place to start our sanctification. And sanctification means becoming more like Christ, becoming closer to him, 
uh, I've heard some people say becoming a mirror image of him, which is, it's impossible, and sanctification is a process you can never finish, not on this earth, because it's impossible to be sinless and perfect like Jesus, but we can try, and we should try, and here's the perfect place to come and to be sanctified, and as I said, we can do those things at home, we can do those things wherever, but in the church here, the presence of God is a great place to really feel the Spirit drawing you, to, to evaluate your heart and to say, Lord, I, I've been struggling with this. Please help me and lead me. And it's a lot easier for us to listen because sometimes when we're at home or we're wherever and God tells us something, it's, it's a lot harder to want to wanna listen and to remember and to put effort. But when we're here and we can feel that, it's, it's much easier to, to be willing to let him lead. Uh, last, last few verses here in 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Church is a great place for us to work on our gifts. Whenever we go out anywhere, people are watching us. They want to know, what's it mean to be a Christian? We are a representative and an ambassador for Christ. So when we're in the church here, it's a great opportunity not only to work on ourselves, but to work on our gifts, our tools that we can use to lead others to Christ, to be able to share the gospel. We can, we can, uh, we can learn what those gifts are in church. We can practice those gifts in church. We can strengthen them. And if, if we're not doing the right thing in church, we can't do the right thing in the world. So here's a great place to, to strengthen them on each other, to learn from each other. And when we stumble, to have a fellow believer to gently and correctly lift us up again and to be able to show us maybe what we did wrong. Um, but just to do that in a place like church and then take it to the world, we can be ready and and be emboldened and know when we go out and preach the gospel that we are ready, that we are prepared, and that we are preaching the right thing. Um, if you'd like to read more about, about the gifts, uh, gifts of the Spirit, and some of the gifts, um, roles in the church and stuff, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So that's your, that's your homework for the week is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But as I, as I wrap this up, I just wanted to, uh, to conclude that coming to church will not save you. Coming to church is not in, in the, uh, the plan of salvation. It, it does not substitute sacrificing or surrendering to Christ, but it is important in our growth as believers that we do come here. And it's also not to say that what we do at home is not important or what we do in the world is not important, but the church is our base. We need to be here. We need to be grounded. We need to remember um, we need to feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit and then use that to start our week off right as we go home and as we go into the world. So.